This is the Common Health from the CSIS Bipartisan Alliance for Global Health Security, engaging senior leaders on questions of how to address our common health security challenges in this post-COVID moment. I'm delighted today to be joined by Donald G. McNeil. Donald, thank you so much for making time to be with us today. Thank you for inviting me. Donald was the senior science and health reporter at the New York Times for many decades. He served at the New York Times for 45 years, started right after graduation from UCAL Berkeley in 1976 as a copy boy, spent time, we'll talk about this, early in his career in South Africa and elsewhere in Africa and France in a critical period around the HIV epidemic, came to become the Times global health reporter from 2002 on and distinguished himself at many different points in writing on Zika, and certainly became a very prominent voice on COVID from early on, in including the February 27th, a famous February 27th podcast on The Daily with Michael Barbaro. Just as a note, Donald, we started our Coronavirus Crisis Update podcast series that same week and ran 175 episodes. Donald also was wrote two of the 15 articles on COVID-19 that won the 2021 Pulitzer Prize for Public Service. So, Donald, thank you so much. We're here to talk about your new book. It came out January 9th, Wisdom of Plagues, which is a highly personal book. Uh, it's really several different things. It's a memoir, reflections on 25 years of covering epidemics. It's your own personal story. It's an analysis and history around the approaches on pandemics, and it's It's prescriptive in talking about things that need to be done better in preparing ourselves for these types of threats. So thank you. Let's start by talking about your own personal story. And I I, I thought we'd break that into a couple of different dimensions. The first is this unusual history that you have of moving to Africa in the mid-90s at a critical moment in the HIV epidemic as it was burgeoning. And you were there for a seven-year period. How did that shape your own personal outlook, both as a journalist, as a humanitarian, as somebody with a deep interest in science, health, equity, as you look back? It was the beginning of it all. I was not, I mean, I graduated in rhetoric from Berkeley. I got into journalism because I was the editor of the Daily Californian and, you know, went to New York. We always wanted to live in New York. Got a job as a copy boy at the New York Times. I was looking at the, the Senate floor yesterday and saw all these pages sitting there on a bench waiting to go pick up things. And I thought, that's a job I used to do. I actually sat on a bench and used to wait until reporters said copy. And then I would go up and take the papers out of their hands and bring it up to the desk. So then I, then I was a reporter. I was an environmental reporter. I was a regular, you know, police beat. I was briefly the Long Island bureau chief. I was an environmental reporter. I broke the Love Canal story not nationally. I did a lot of other things. And then I, I was actually a theater beat correspondent at the time that my former wife, my first wife, was looking for a job. Uh, she was also, she was an editor at the Times, and she wanted to climb the ladder. And in those days, you didn't really climb the ladder at the Times unless you'd been a foreign correspondent. And so she kept asking for a foreign correspondent job, but then suddenly out of the blue, it comes up. The, the editor-in-chief, Joe Lullyveld, gave us a choice of five different places, and we ultimately ended up in Johannesburg, which is where he'd been before. And it was there that all this started. It was a sea change. You know, I'd, I'd hardly vac- I vacationed a few times overseas in, in France and England, places like that before. And suddenly, you know, and we had two young kids and we had to, you know, tell them, hey, kids, guess what? As soon as kindergarten and third grade ends, we're going to be moving to Africa. And, you know, they thought they were going to be eaten by lions and we wouldn't have flush toilets and it was going to be, you know, the, you know, the end of their lives. And we were just as nervous, too. My wife was the bureau chief. And and so you know, every bureau is at the New York Times is always sort of seen as a one story bureau. You know, France is wine and cheese and crazy French politics and England is the royal family. I mean, there are many other things to cover, but you always are sort of focused on one story. And at the Times, you know, apartheid and, and its consequences was really the story. And Suzanne was covering most of the most of those big stories. And so I was always casting around for other things to do. And the reason I got involved in, in this reporting was because the commercial attache at the U.S. Embassy asked to call me. And said, you know, there's this outrageous law that the South African parliament is about to pass, which is going to, you know, give their health minister the right to cancel any patent he wants on any drug and import it from anywhere in the world where it's made cheaply. And initially, I thought this was outrageous because I thought, you know, I've been brought up reading 
you know, stories of Thomas Edison and George Washington Carver and other inventors. And the idea that somebody could cancel a patent struck me as terrible. But the more I dug into that story, the, and, and the more I ended up talking to Doctors Without Borders, who were sort of lead, leading the push for getting the country to pass that law, the more I realized, wow, the villains of this piece are really the United States government and the big pharma companies, because Africans are dying at the time in the tens of thousands, you know, later in the millions. And the companies absolutely refused to lower their prices from fifteen dollars to $20,000 down to anything less. It was just like, that's the price, that's it. If you can't afford it, go off and die. So that article and, and also, you know, the things I did reporting it, including visiting an AIDS orphanage in Johannesburg, there wasn't that much AIDS in South Africa at the time. There was HIV was everywhere, but most of it had come over the border after the borders reopened in 1990. So while probably millions of people of South Africans were infected, you didn't see the walking skeletons and, and, the, and the people on the bridge of death that I had seen as a kid growing up in San Francisco and that I saw on the streets of, uh, you know, Chelsea and Greenwich Village in New York, you know, you, you didn't see the effects of AIDS. But as soon as I went outside of South Africa, when I went to Zambia, when I went to Zimbabwe, when I went to Kenya, I, you know, attended funerals where I could see or you know, watch the washing of the corpse. It was obviously, you know, somebody who had been a walking skeleton was now dead. And you, you could see the classic symptoms of death from AIDS there. And, and that really, that whole experience turned my world around to realize that the people supported by the United States were really the bad guys in this thing. The big pharma was just relentless about not – and and they had arguments for it. They said, look, if we do anything to weaken what we're doing, you know, one pharmaceutical company was snapping up another pharmaceutical company in those days through through leverage buyouts. And they said, if we, if we made anything cheaper, if we lose money in any division, we will be bought up by some other bigger company that's more ruthless than us. So we won't do it. And then it was some years later when I was in Paris that, you know, I was doing follow-up stories on this. And I said, is there anybody who could make these drugs safely? Doctors of the border said, yeah, they could be made in India. And I said, but I thought the Indians were all pirate companies who were, you know, making ripoffs. They said, no, there are a lot of bad drug companies in India, but there are some good ones too. And I said, name them. And they named three. So I went off to India and two were sort of uncooperative or semi-cooperative and one, CIPLA, under Dr. Yusuf Hamid, just welcomed me and let me inspect all of his factories. And he was he had been making active ingredients for American and British and German and French drug makers for years. So he had passed all their inspections. His factories were spotless. They had all this brand new German equipment. And the reason he could make everything for pennies on the dollar was because he, did, he paid his top engineers and chemists $10,000 a year. And he then, a couple of months later, he offered to make antiretroviral drugs for Africa for less than a dollar a day, less than $365 a year. And that was the big watershed event. And he, I'm lucky that he chose to sort of make that announcement through me. And that ended up on the front page as the pre previous story about him and his company had been. And that really sort of smacked the big drug companies of the world in the face because I made the argument that his factories have passed all sorts of American inspections. They make legitimate drugs. This is fascinating. And just that revelation around your discovery that, in fact, there was a solution. At the same time that the tsunami of infection was beginning to manifest with skyrocketing levels of mortality in Africa, those things were sort of coming together, right? Antiretrovirals appear in 96, but it's not until we get into the naught decade with the Global Fund and PEPFAR and these sort of confrontations that you're describing between industry and governments and the consciousness around this changes. And you were in the midst of all of this. Yes. It, three things had to happen. The price of the drugs had to come down or nothing would go forward. I mean, somebody had to make these drugs for a dollar a day, not $50 a day. Then somebody had to come up with the money because the African countries didn't have the money to pay even, you know, for the number of people they had who were sick. And for the fact that you need a lot of infrastructure, you need to be able to do testing, you need to be able to build the pharmacies, you need to be able to have the supply chains, you need to be able to do follow-up appointments to make sure that people aren't getting levels of toxicity. They didn't have the, the public health infrastructure to do it. And the donors were there, but the donors didn't have the expertise. They didn't, you know, they weren't used to dealing with drug companies. They were used to sort of handing money off to, you know, the, the USAID or something like that and, and, and you know, helping build roads and things. So you had to have this whole infrastructure come together. And PEPFAR and, and the Global Fund and ultimately the Clinton Foundation, too. The Clinton Foundation, Clinton, as a president, had been opposed to all of this. He'd been opposed to the Southern law. He did a 180-degree flip, partially because of AIDS activists showing up during Al Gore's campaign and saying, Gore's greed kills Africans. And while my stories had very few readers, because not that many people thought about 
what's going on in Africa. The political reporters' stories, the minute they got it, those guys get, you know, readers like up the wazoo. And so, yeah, it suddenly became a major campaign issue. And Gore and Clinton turned around and the Clinton Foundation started making the market to bring the Indian drug makers and the big donors and the African countries together and say, okay, you've got the drugs, you've got the money, you've got the need. How can we work out a deal? Right. Another thing I'd add to that, Donald, is Peter Piot played a critically important role at UNAIDS as a once diplomat. UNAIDS, yes, once UNAIDS created, yes, it'd be very important. As a yes. person who had technical street cred around ARTs and public health infrastructure and the like, but also was empowered really to begin trying to negotiate among donors, corporate sector, partner governments in making this work somehow. Yes. And of course, when George Bush came into office, that the beginning of PEPFAR, I mean, this was under originally under Randall Tobias, but he sort of, uh, you know, imploded. And then under Mark Dibel, who was his successor, and who then went on to run the Global Fund. But, you know, similar role uh, in in making sure that the the money was there at the crucial time. Yes, there were there were many people who were involved in very similar and important ways in this in those early days. So you have that experience, which is pretty remarkable set of experiences that span what's happening in Africa around the burgeoning process of the spread of spread of infection, but you don't see it manifest until it just bolts forward in the late 90s, early naught decade, and then people are panicked. And you were also able to connect to India and think about the industrial possibilities in terms of generic solutions for this. Then you come back to New York in the next phase of your career. Say a bit about that where you you strike a deal to really become one of the first sort of dedicated global health reporters. Yeah. Uh, so we came back. There, there was a lot of turmoil at the times. That was during the sort of exploding Hell Reigns era. And um, uh, we were called back to New York pretty abruptly. And I just had not done anything to sort of prepare myself for the transition for New York. I hadn't made any plans. I hadn't flown back to say, what's my next job? I just kind of rocked up in the newsroom, you know, and, and had a conversation with Howell, who said, do you want to go back to culture where I've been covering theater? And I said, no, I don't think so. It just, it just felt like something kind of silly out of a previous life and stuff. I mean, I had really changed in my outlook of the world by that time. And he said, well, do you want to go to science? And I thought, OK, that sounds interesting. Be a science reporter for The New York Times. And so he sent me to see Corey Dean, who was the science editor. And she said, First, she said, I don't have any place for you on my payroll. And I said, well, the boss says I work for you now, so maybe you could ask him for some money. And then she said, well, I need a health writer. And I said, well, OK, you know, I, I, I've got some expertise in that now, but you've got, you know, Larry Altman, who's an MD, and Libby Rosenthal is an MD, and you've got a lot of great reporters who have many more qualifications than I do, but they cover mostly the things that threaten Americans, like cancer and heart disease and stuff. How about I cover what in those days was called third world disease. How about I cover the things that, and she originally said, we don't really have a mandate for that. We don't, we don't do that. And I said, well, come on. I mean, large numbers of poor people in the world die. We cover it when they die of, in wars. We cover it when they die of starvation. We cover it when they die of, you know, one tragedy or another, you know, more than, you know, between one and 2 billion people are at risk of these diseases that we don't even think about in the United States, everything from malaria on down to, you know, worm diseases and myxomatoma and stuff. I said, why not let me, you know, make this my beat. And she said, okay, we'll do it as an experiment. And that experiment became the rest of my career. And how did you get on to this theme of diseases that are near eradication, dangerous diseases that are near eradication, which became a theme? So at the times when you're on a new beat, you kind of have, you've got some time to acclimate yourself to sort of, and I believe me, I needed a lot of acclimating because I knew something about AIDS, but I knew nothing about all these other diseases. And the more I learned about it, the more I realized, that, you know, that my beat suddenly encompassed 50 diseases from, you know, everything from malaria to Crimean Congo hemorrhagic fever and, and Machupo virus and things you've never heard of that people actually die of and things I'd never heard of. And so I was having to, you know, educate myself by reading magazine article after magazine, you know, interviewing one doctor after another and saying, OK, I'm sorry, can you explain to me again? Once you get the malaria parasite into you, where does it go? It goes into the liver and then it's in the red blood cells and then it's, and they were so patient with me and explaining to me again and again with every disease, how this works. So I was having to learn, how does the envelope of of a virus work? How does it attach to a cell? What's an antibody? Where do antibodies come from? Okay. What are B cells and T cells? Why are they called B? All the stuff I was learning literally from the ground up and the one thing I regret about those days, if I had known then as much as I know about smallpox now, maybe I could have played a role in stopping the New York Times from helping start the war in Iraq. 
because I would have known that you could that Saddam Hussein couldn't have weaponized smallpox because he would have had to vaccinate his entire army. And smallpox vaccinations make marks. And we would have known through the Kurds or somebody else who was in contact with the CIA whether or not Saddam Hussein's whole army had been recently vaccinated against smallpox. Without sm- universal smallpox vaccination, the only superpower in the world left is Israel because they're the only country that normally vaccinates much of their population against smallpox. That was true then. I'm not sure if it's true now. Anyway, I'm, I'm, I'm rambling here. But so I was just kind of swamped with learning all these diseases. But another thing about the times is when you're new to a beat, you get a few years where the where the bosses are usually kind of nice to you and say, if you want to take a year and stop doing daily stories and focus on a big project and take a shot at getting a Pulitzer on your beat, okay, now's the time. And so at that time, which was like 2004 or five, I think, Celia Duggar and I decided for a project to write a series on how come there are so many diseases that like smallpox are hovering right on the brink of eradication, but just can't be pushed over the brink. They can't get eradicated. Well, how, how is it we haven't eradicated polio? How is it we haven't eradicated trachoma, you know, which is the disease used to keep get people turned away at Ellis Island? How is it we haven't eradicated river blindness? Because it's easy with, you know, with one antibiotic. How come we haven't eliminated guinea worm, a disease nobody ever heard of, but they were, we were, they were down to like 50 cases in the world at the time, down from millions. And so we did a whole big series about diseases hovering on the brink of eradication, and each one was different. That was one big series. And then a couple of years later, they let me do a big series on why so many millions of people died in agony each year, mostly from cancer, because they had no access to morphine or any other opioid painkillers. Every every country had such strong laws against opioids and such strong sort of natural fears of opioids because of the heroin epidemics in the 1960s that, that you couldn't get it. And, and I went everywhere from Sierra Leone to, to India to Japan to write about why people died with no pain relief. And, and, and the agony, you, you, you met people and they were, their heads were swollen up like pumpkins and they were just lying there moaning and, and dying. And I was going around with doctors who were supplying it. And it was horrible. And it was stuff that, you know, like the surgery on my shoulder, the pain could have been taken away by a simple drug that was not, a, not available because the whole country was afraid people would become drug addicts. And, you know, you could then argue that my series helped create the opioid crisis in the United States. But, you know, I was writing about people who were dying of cancer, not about people who had toothache. I mean, what happened in the United States is that people would have chronic diseases like chronic back pain or toothache or, you know, a brief injury, and they would just be given an endless prescription for opioids because the opioid industry was pushing the idea that, oh, no, these things aren't really aren't addictive. It's just, you know, you can taper off them as soon as the pain goes away, which turns out in many, many people's cases not to be true. But I was arguing that people didn't need to die in agony needlessly when there was a solution for it. And the solution just wasn't available, even though it was dirt cheap because it's just poppy extract and could be made cheaply in any country in the world. You got onto that big problem pretty early and it's persisted, right? It's, I mean, the whole access to opioids for those that are suffering from cancer and other, other life-threatening diseases with enormous pain quotients, that's still a I big think issue. My articles did help change the National Cancer Plan of India, the, 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 you know, how they handle. And so in India anyway, which is where large amounts of the world's opioids are grown, you know, and then mailed off to the companies in the United States that, that turn it into I mean, opium poppies. India changed its protocols so that it now offers palliative care. But it, it varies enormously country by country. I mean, it's, yes, you're, you're correct. It's not available in many countries and it's a tragedy. So before we get to COVID, along the way, you're also covering pandemic flu, your, the various forms of uh, threatened flu. You're covering Ebola. You're covering Zika. By the time COVID shows up, it seems to me you've gotten your brain around the patterns of response to this. Is that fair enough? Exactly right. So I I suddenly realized, and Zika played a big part of this because Zika was one of those epidemics that actually did scare the United States, at least briefly. We never were very scared about, uh, about avian, well, we were, we were scared about avian flu, but it never really spread. But Zika was definitely something that spread all over the Americas and then basically stopped in North Miami and South Texas. But all the craziness, all the rumors, all the lies, all the doubts, all the you know, initial skepticism and inactivity, including by the CDC, were all that pattern was established at the beginning of Zika. And I then I saw it repeating itself with COVID. And I saw how it repeated itself in in the history of AIDS, you know, when AIDS was dismissed as a non problem, 
or is something that we, you know, it's fine. We're going to have a vaccine for it within three years. So I don't have to worry about it. You know, all this, you know, the more I read it, the history of the beginning days of AIDS, I saw history repeating itself. But yeah, I, what I saw at the beginning of COVID was the history of, you know, the bad, dumb reactions to pandemics repeating itself even before the pandemic arrived. I mean, the sort of the, the denialism of the existence of the looming threat and the you know, wanting to think about anything else and, and not wanting to believe that it was going to affect our lives. So when COVID shows up in early 2020 and, you know, you've got you've already earned your doctorate in pandemics. <laughs> I don't have another degree, you realize. But. And uh, and suddenly you, you're you elevated, right? You're asked by people like Mike Barbaro, by others, by the readers of the New York Times to make sense of what's transpiring. And you're bringing this perspective that I think leads you to make some pretty strong statements very early on as to the gravity of the threat and the speed in which it's going to uh, manifest itself. Is that accurate? Yes, that's accurate. And I didn't count this in the book. I mean, in the beginning, when I first saw something about mysterious disease in Chinese city, I thought, boy, that sounds just like the beginning of SARS. But I, I was busy. We were having a bad flu season that year. People forget this. That was, it was not as bad as 2017, but it was definitely a bad flu season. I was writing an article about that. So I couldn't be bothered to drop everything and, and cover this thing. But, but the more reports came out of China and I started paying more attention, and particularly the day that it jumped from 500 cases and 12 dead to 10,000 cases and 200 dead, I realized, I was sitting on the subway, I went, holy cow, this isn't SARS. SARS stopped at a few hundred cases and, you know, it rose to a few thousand and then a few hundred dead, but that's it. This, that's what happened in 1918. Rapidly spreading virus, 2% mortality. 2% mortality doesn't sound like much, but the virus affects everybody in the world. And 2% of the world dies. That's many, many, many millions of people. And I went into work the next day all hyped up, all worried. And I went to my boss and said, this is it. This is the big one. This is the one we've been talking about for years. The big one, capital T H, you know, T B E. Oh. And her reaction was, you know, Donald, you can't just say that on your own. You know, fine, you know a lot, but you got to talk to a lot of experts before we can say that in the New York Times. So I did call a bunch of experts. And, you know, the, the scorecard was essentially eight said yes, they thought it was going to become a pandemic. Two said no, and two just didn't want to commit. And Fauci was one of the eight, and he was actually on his way into the White House. I caught him on his cell phone as he was on his way into the White House to talk about this threat from China and whether or not they should take it seriously. And so I wrote that article. Now, that article ran on page 12 of the paper. It did not make page one. There wasn't even a reefer to it. But that was the article that essentially said this is going to be a pandemic. And then that kind of, you know, as things as it became clear that I was right, that's why people started coming to me and saying, What's going to happen next? You saw at that time. Was, and, and, and I had to start speculating a lot, not just on my own, but I, I would be calling dozens of people. And, and by now it branched out, not just people who were specialists in virology, but people who were historians like John Barry of, of, of previous pandemics, people who were economists who had studied the, you know, the effects of disease, people who were experts in crowd psychology and in vaccine acceptance and, in, and things like that. You know, what, what are we likely to face? You know, what, what sort of doubts? What happened? What did happen in 1918 in the early days? You know, so you'd have somebody like Howard Markell who's a historian of the disease. So I had lots and lots of sources, and eventually it sort of settled into a pattern where in addition to the regular stuff I was writing, the sort of updates, I was also writing these once a month gigantic 5,000 word heaves sort of saying, what is the next month or two in this pandemic likely to look like? And in the beginning, I was very, very dark. And, and I, at one point, I was ordered to optimize, you know, make my story happier, less gloomy. The one that I, I produced in April, it, was, it had all those um, black and white photographs of refrigerated trucks full of dead bodies on Randall's Island and the, the nurses putting on their PPE again for the third time because there wasn't enough to go around and stuff like that. And, I, you know, I was upset that they were asking me to make it happier, more rosy tinted. They didn't want to believe. This is my own bosses. The, you know, the master didn't want to believe. And then later, come the end of summer, beginning of fall, I began to look at the vaccines. And I was looking literally just at the monkey data and the um, phase one testing data. And I looked and thought, wow, I'd been following mRNA vaccines for a while. I'd heard about them. Uh, you know, I didn't know the details, but I'd, I'd been watching them for other diseases. And I thought, we all knew that mRNA vaccines were going to be safe. We never thought we thought the weakness was going to be that they weren't effective because the body would break down the mRNA before it had a chance to reprogram any genetic instructions to start producing antibodies. And in fact, in both the monkeys and the phase one tests, it was really effective at producing a big antibody response, a neutralizing antibody response. And I thought, wow, if that carries through in the phase two and phase three tests, we've got a vaccine and an easy to make, fast to make vaccine. And so 
I began to get optimistic. And then everybody who'd been used to me for six months being Mr. Doom and Gloom was in shock. And I remember Joe Kahn, who's now the editor-in-chief of the Times, sat in on a science meeting and he said, Donald, you're optimistic? I never, never heard of that. I said, yeah, because I, I mean, look, we're going to go through hell. This is going to be the valley, valley of the shadow of death this winter, because winter is when all respiratory diseases spread and people die and our hospitals may get overwhelmed. But once we get through this winter, by January or February or March, it looks like they may be able to start rolling out vaccine. And that will change the course of this pandemic. And so, yeah, that turned out to be true, too. I just want to ask, you go from years of careful work that, that really built up your expertise in this and your grounding in this broad portfolio of issues that fell under health security and fell under sort of pathogenic threats and the like. And then suddenly this thing happens with COVID and you're elevated and it's more than just writing, being a journalist, you're becoming useful to a very fearful, a very frightened public. And you're also there in a much more visible way in an environment that's quite turbulent in terms of the stakes of judgment, the stakes around what's happening and what's going to happen next. The political environment shifts in the spring to a very charged, divisive, increasingly toxic environment where facts are being questioned and challenged and fake facts are being disseminated and the like. And the scrutiny of everyone intensifies, including journalists. Say a bit about what that all meant for you in this period. Okay. So a bunch of things. I mean, I would say that all of the writing, the articles I wrote inside the New York Times, hewed pretty closely to classic New York Times objective journalism. It was not my opinion. It was it was I was quoting experts. I was calling people. I would say something this, something that. There's disagreement. I quote this person. I quote that person. It was all pretty much classic New York Times. So, it, which made it doubly weird that people were telling me to lighten the mood of my piece. You know, because I was thinking like I'm just being as objective as I can. What happened on the daily was completely different. And I, I, I can't really explain it because you're asking me to look at myself as a character, which is kind of what I became on the daily. I became this character known behind his back as DGM2. There was even a thing called the Daily Daily, which was a critique of the daily each day where they would talk about who was on the daily. And they kept saying, let's have DGM2 back because he's the only person that makes us you know, feel calm about this. And I don't know what it is about my voice or the way I talk or the rapport I had with Michael Barbaro and his producers who were very important because they would very often call me up and say, we want to talk about this, 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 and this. And I'd go, wait a minute, this is wrong. That's wrong. I know you saw that on CNN. I know you read that in, you know, in the Wall Street Journal, but I, I disagree with it. And here's why. And they would then reframe Michael's question so that I often had a different take on the conventional wisdom like particularly by my optimism. And I also, I think I took more scientific and less political. Um, I mean, and then I really do focus on the epidemiology and the crowd psychology and not on what leaders like the president of the United States, who doesn't know anything about disease, who wanted to make people drink bleach. You know, I just didn't pay that much attention to what he said. And, you know, places like the Times have a tendency to give extra weight to whatever comes out of the White House, stupid as it may be. And so I was ignoring that. So whatever was happening, I was turning into this kind of character on the daily. And they kept turning to me because clearly the audiences found it reassuring. Now, then the denialism and the doubts arose very early on in the pandemic. I I mean, even when early on, when Nancy Messonnier said, this is going to, it's a question not of if, but of when that this virus gets to this country. The president flew into a rage as he was flying back from from, in, from his trip to India saying, you know, the stock market fell a thousand points late yesterday. You got to stop her from saying that kind of thing because you're killing me here because the stock market's dropping. Well, you can't save the stock market from falling when a pandemic actually is happening. And so that that was kind of the beginning of the doubt and the denialism and 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 his tendencies to want to wanna, you know, pretend it wasn't happening. But then he went back and forth. I mean, the messages out of the White House were just kooky in the beginning because he, he, he eventually was convinced it was dangerous. And then he went along with the idea of 15 days to stop the spread. So it was really it was the president who started the national lockdowns. But he also somehow, you know, in part of the horse trading there, became convinced that the lockdown would only have to last 15 days. And, you know, even the Chinese had incredibly effective lockdowns, but they lasted three months. But then they drove the case numbers in China to zero by the end of April. 
And we never had less than 30,000 cases a day because our our lockdowns were always lockdown light. They were a garden party version of lockdowns. People traveled all over the country. They left New York and spread the virus to, you know, all the suburbs and experts where they, you know, work from home. They spread it to Florida and ultimately it spread to everywhere, even the smallest cities in the mountain states and stuff. There were many, many phases of doubt and, and, and the president leaned into them, you know, along the way saying this is a conspiracy on the part of the liberals who like lockdowns to make sure that I'm not returned to office. And then later, even though he did this brilliant effort for making vaccines, Operation Work Speed, that was like one of the great successes of his presidency, he then began to treat it, you know, the, the delay in approving the vaccines as an attempt by the companies to keep him from getting reelected. And then he lost. So he doubled down on that. And, and then when the time came to get the vaccine, he never even revealed for months that he had had the vaccine. He, he had it in January as soon as he could get it. He didn't even admit having had it until March. He didn't get it on TV. So, but of course, I mean, this craziness had started while I was still doing my reporting, but it became even greater as the as time went on. And ultimately, I was ousted from the Times, essentially, in you know, on February 1st of 2021. So I was no longer covering it for the New York Times. So my role in that, and it sort of shifted over into White House coverage. And I, I think there was a be, an important behind the scenes role that I used to play at the Times before I was asked to, which is that I wrote a lot of notes that were never seen in the paper. And they were notes from the very beginning of the pandemic. You know, I mean, I, I used to be sent stories that other reporters are about to file and they'd say things like, well, the reason the virus is in Iran, but not in Iraq, is because there's something genetically different about Arabs versus Persians that makes it more likely that they would suffer from this, and they would be quoting some eminent doctor in Saudi Arabia. And I'd like write a note saying, "No, you know, this is not true. You know, under we maybe have different skin colors, but under the skins, our immune systems are the same. This virus has no magic quality that allows it to preserve black people or white people. You know, I mean, come on, guys, people believed crazy stuff in the beginning." And it was very hard as, you know, I, and I was, and my tone sometimes gets as like it is now where I'm sort of talking as if I thought they were idiots. But how could you put this in the paper? How do you think about putting it in the paper? And I did tick off some people for my tone, I think, because I was overworked and exhausted and writing a lot of memos. I, I think if I'd been inside writing more memos, I think there would have been a lot more reasonable debate about what it takes to achieve herd immunity during the course of a, of a pandemic and how much vaccine was going to be able to achieve as new data came in, uh, I think I was pretty good about adjusting my sights on what was possible, what was likely to happen based on, on new data. Data from Israel, data from Britain, data. Those other countries were much better than we were producing data. So, yeah, I think, I, I guess what I did, in short, what I'm saying is I think something was lost when I left, but the, the craziness went on. By that time, it was completely out of control, and it still still is. Let's shift to a couple of other top related topics. PEPFAR, which you you've covered carefully, and you're aware of just how monumentally important that program has been, $115 billion. You, you recount in your book the remarkable achievements attached to it. It's been around now for two decades. It's really the flagship. But we've entered a new, much more toxic politics, much more divisive. The reauthorization, the five-year reauthorization is not happening. It's supposed to happen this year. Say a bit about the change of what's happened it appears we've entered a new era around the debate on these issues. Yes, we have. And I think it's very sad. I mean, PEPFAR was a huge success because it was a really bipartisan effort between liberals in Congress who wanted to help out Africa, mostly Africa and other countries, and evangelical conservatives who had long stand, whose churches in the United States had long standing ties to missionary hospitals in Africa and other parts of the world. That joint effort really built and afterwards protected PEPFAR. And the Obama administration was not that interested in PEPFAR and they flat funded it. They were never excited about it. They, they basically just you know, put in the same budget each year even as the need was growing. And so PEPFAR was essentially cut off at the knees fairly early on because it was not able to grow beyond a certain, I think it was like $15, $15 billion a year point. Then the nature of conservatives in the Congress changed, I think. I mean, in Bush's day, most far right conservatives were evangelicals. Some of them were replaced by Tea Party Republicans who were not necessarily evangelical, but interested mostly in cutting taxes. And now even more have been replaced by Trump, MAGA Republicans, 
who are not even, I mean, who are interested in cutting taxes and who are some of whom are evangelicals, but a lot of them are simply interested in making sure that Donald Trump, you know, becomes president again. And, and, I, and I think the base of support from that side has eroded the, the sort of the connection to the, to the churches and the missions. I also think, well, as with Ukraine, people get bored with an issue. It's, it, it's a hot time. And, 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 and then the appetite for continuing to put money into the situation fades. It loses its urgency. It's been a very successful program, which then diminishes the threat and the urgency. Well, it's, but it's not. I, I mean, a million people, 1.3 million people were still infected with HIV last year. We've got, I, it's close to, it's 39 million people in the world living with HIV. And the budget did not increase as the size of the problem kept getting bigger. About as many people are alive with HIV today as have died of HIV in, in history, almost as many. The struggle is that some of those countries came to rely on the United States to do everything for them, to set up their, prop up their healthcare systems, to, to pay the money to buy the drugs. And under the Obama administration, they kept saying, look, you guys got to step in. You know, don't spend your money on fighter jets. Don't spend your money on, you know, fancy new airports or anything like that. You got to step in and save your own people from death. We can't continue to supply the money indefinitely. And some countries cooperated and some didn't. Some, you know, many gov governors, I mean, presidents of those countries are interested only in lining their own pockets. And any, any aid program from the West is an opportunity to steal money. And that becomes real unfortunate. And there were some real struggles for both PEPFAR and the Global Fund when they ran into governments that were corrupt. And, and you, you get a kind of, you know, a longstanding sense of cynicism. PEPFAR is not in the news very much anymore. And so nobody's, you know, sees it as, as their baby to save. But I think it's sad because really the thing that's doing most to stop the spread of HIV in Africa is that so many men are on treatment. We just don't have a way to protect young girls because they are sexually active. I mean, I, I don't like to use the word sexually active for a rape victim or an incest victim, but they are having sex and getting infected no matter what before they are ready to have any sort of intervention that will save them. And I spent a whole chapter in the book on this, whether that intervention is as simple as a condom or whether it's a it, it's an injection that, that can prevent you from getting HIV. That just does not get to young girls in Africa. And I don't know how, that it ever has. But if you get the men, and it's generally older men infecting younger girls, through sugar daddy relationships, through rape, through incestuous relationships, through all sorts of, and through love relationships. It's a, it's a whole combination of things. If you get those men tested and on the drugs, they are no, no longer infectious. So they may pass on syphilis or chlamydia, but they're not passing on HIV. So would you, would you expect we're going to see a, a resurgence of HIV? Yes. If, if PEPFAR is not reauthorized and if it's just kept at its levels now, I think, yes, there will be a resurgence. Let's talk about antimicrobial resistance. You touch on that in your book also. So you're worried about it. I think a lot of people are worried about it. This is a big year for AMR in the sense that it's the first big global high-level meeting since 2016. And the one that was held on the margins of the UN General Assembly in 2016 actually had some impact on changing calculations and strategies around AMR. Say a bit about that. Why, why are you worried? I'm worried because it seems to be... It's, it's killing more people every year, and it's killing more people under more circumstances. It's not like there's a whole lot of easily transmissible, you know, antibiotic-resistant microbes around. The great fear, of course, in that field is TB. I mean, if all TB turns into XDR-TB, we're going to be back in the 18th century again, you know, in La Boheme and Carmen and Moulin Rouge, people dying of TB. But just more and more deaths in hospitals from, from antibiotic-resistant organisms. And unfortunately, the, the major drivers of that, the things like giving large amounts of antibiotics to animals aren't stopping. I, there's a lot of important science that I think we re really need to push. There are now more and more vaccines that will prevent infection with deadly strains. I think I just read yesterday there's a vaccine that protects both against E. coli and Klebsiella. It, it, it targets a particular iron-bound protein that both of them either make. Or I don't want to get pretend to know more than I do, but vaccines against bacteria I mean, they've existed for a long time. Diphtheria vaccine is an antibacterial vaccine and BCG vaccine. I mean, we definitely need a vaccine against tuberculosis better than the BCG vaccine, which was invented back in the you know, early part of the last century. And we need better stewardship. I mean, one of the things I'm in favor of is the less routine, you know, okay, I'm going to give you this antibiotic. If that doesn't work, I'll give you the next one. If that doesn't work, I'll give you the next one. That just builds resistance. I think we ought to have multi-drug cocktails for antibiotics. And I think we also sometimes ought to try to find ways to deliver antibiotics to the site of the infection rather than making them completely systemic. I mean, I think if there was some way to make sure the antibiotic stayed in your ear when you had an ear infection or stayed in your sinuses when you had a sinus infection, instead of making you swallow some pills that blow out every good bacteria in your gut, 
you know, and then circulate and, you know, kill other, other bacteria on you as, as being the number one solution. I'd, I'd love to see other ways of tackling this, but I don't have the answer. And I also don't see the answer coming down the line anytime quickly. You're pretty critical of the field of public health, and you push back on some of the common wisdom. You're arguing that public health, we need to be much tougher, faster. We need to be more assertive in, with regard to mandates. We need to rebalance the consideration of personal liberty versus collective, collective well-being and responsibility. And at the center of all of this is trust and faith in science and an environment of lies and disinformation, misinformation. So say a bit about how you are diagnosing this situation and what needs, because your prescriptions, it seems to me, your conclusions are quite, are quite vivid and they're, and they're tough. They're extremely radical. I recognize that they're going to piss a lot of people off. There was an article by the Brownstone Institute just a couple of weeks ago called The Tyrannical Mind of Donald G. McNeil Jr., and it was, it was just an attack on me as against every libertarian idea the author had. He was nice enough to call my book brilliant and, and beautifully argued and stuff and said that that's what made it scary, he said. But yeah, I'm definitely ticking off a lot of people. So I'm under no illusions that Congress is going to pass a single thing I, I, I advocate, you know, the ending of religious exemptions, even though the ending of religious exemptions in California and and New York produced terrific results in getting more kids vaccinated against the diseases we do not want children to die of, like measles. Even though it produces good results, I know that the mood of the country or the mood, mood of the right of the country and even and the, and libertarians of the left as well is, is against everything I say. If I'm writing for, with any audience in mind, I'm trying to get into the heads of people who are currently medical students and public health students who are one day going to be running the CDC and the WHO and the NIH and everything and try to get them to think more like George Patton than like Florence Nightingale. Now, that's unfair to Florence Nightingale, who was actually quite an activist in a way. I'm just trying to say, stop wanting to be loved and think about winning the war. You are in a war against, you know, when a pan you know, most of the time, it's great. You can be loved. You can have a nice bedside manner. You can be very calm. You can be good with the press. But when you're faced with a pandemic and a million Americans are going to die on your watch, or 2 million, which was in the numbers before, or, you know, if, if something like H5N1 were actually to go pandemic, we might be looking at X millions, put a number in front of it. I'm not going to put a number in front of it until, until I see more data, but this could happen. And you are going to have to respond and you're going to have to respond in a way that is effective. And that may mean, you know, going after the one group in which the disease is spreading quickly. And in the case of a number of sexually transmitted diseases, this is not all gay men, but a certain subset of highly sexually active and very mobile gay men that, that have been responsible both for the spread of HIV in its early days and monkeypox last year. You may have to go after Orthodox Jews or Alpine skiers who were important in, in, in spreading COVID in its early days. And I make that point. It's not always the marginalized and the oppressed and the poor who are the group who is responsible for spreading the disease. But you have to figure out where the disease is. You have to treat those people. You may have to isolate them. If you have to isolate them by force, too bad. You got to do it. And the model for me, everybody hates it when I say this, is China did an astonishing thing. China took a disease that was already explosive in the second biggest city in China, whatever. It was like the equivalent of their, their equivalent of Chicago, Wuhan. The disease was all over the place. They stopped that disease dead in its tracks and by the end of April, from just from January to April, they got to zero cases. And everybody's like, lockdowns, lockdowns, lockdowns. You can't really anybody. The cure is worse than the disease. Da, 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 da. You know, wine, wine, wine. Their lockdowns were brutal, but they were short and they were incredibly effective. And what they then did was they found everybody who was infected. They tested vast numbers of people and they isolated them in gymnasiums away from their families. And they're like, oh my God, you ripped children away from their mothers. Yes. So mom didn't infect the family. 70 to 80 percent of all infections in the early part of COVID in China were within the family. And you want to you do not want Chris Cuomo living in his basement because Chris Cuomo, good as he is about living in his basement and how what lovely appearances he makes on CNN, managed to infect his entire family. And that's how disease spreads, because then Sonny Boy, you know, Chris Cuomo's son goes off to school and manages to infect his class or whatever. My point is that home isolation is a bad idea. And yes, I believe in vaccination. I don't believe if somebody really doesn't want a vaccine that you would like knock them down on the ground and you jab them in the arm. But if you want to leave the house, if you want to go to the grocery store, if you want to ride on an airplane, if you want to ride on a bus, if you want to ride on the New York City subway, I would say, yeah, 
you have to be vaccinated. In the same way, if, if you're a kid in this country and you want to go to kindergarten, your parents want you to go to kindergarten, you have to be vaccinated against like, close to 15 diseases now because those diseases, you know, we used to live in a country where one third of our children died you know, before they reached adulthood. Now, most people have two kids. I mean, my parents had five kids. My father, my mother died. My father remarried. I had, you know, I grew up in a family of 10 people. That was partially Catholicism, but it was partially just in those days, people had a lot of kids because you didn't expect all of them to make it to adulthood. And if, and, you know, particularly in the days before social security, your kids were going to be the reason, you know, how you survived in your old age. All right. We're now in a world where most people have two kids. We do not want to return to the days when one third of all those kids die because we will, you know, you know, there will be a lot of grieving mothers around if that happens and mothers, fathers, everybody. Um, and it will significantly change the history of the United States. So, yeah, I'm in favor of protecting people against diseases and people bitch and yell about, you know, how tyrannical this is. And I've, I've used the expression myself and I've essentially fed my enemies exactly the line they want. As I've said, the longer I cover diseases and pandemics and watch countries fail, the more of a public health fascist I turn into that I really want to tell people if we have a solution, you have to take it. You, I do not have a constitutionally protected right to give you a fatal disease. And you have a right to expect the government to stop me from giving you that fatal disease. The same way, even though I have the right to have a gun in my house, you have a right. If I walk out of the house with that gun and start shooting people on the street, you have the right to call 911 and say, hey, this guy's using his gun to kill people. Take it away from him. That's my argument. Vaccine is, is essentially an extension of the police power of the state. And that's, that's what the Supreme Court found in 1905 in Jacobson versus Massachusetts, that the government has a responsibility to protect people from lethal threats. And whether that lethal threat is the Japanese Navy or the Russian uh, you know, missile system or me with an AR-15 or me with a lethal transmissible disease, the government has a right to protect you from me. In fact, the government has a duty to protect you from me. And that's my argument. And that makes me kind of unpopular. And, and you know, I'll live with it. You know, I'm 70 years old and cranky. Thank you. Well, I think this is an important, important to the national debate, frankly, because we are in this period where all of these things are subject to reconsideration now in this post-COVID sort of period. Let's end our conversation today. I want to come back to... I thought you might want to end there. No, 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 no. <laughs> teetering off my soapbox and crashing no, no, no. into I'd, the, the crowd. I'd like to come back to the period of your departure from the New York Times in the early, early 2021. That was a... I don't want to relitigate or go into all of the who did what to whom and, and that that's all in the public record. What I wanted to ask you is to reflect now. It's been three years since that time. That was an intensely overheated period in ter a cultural and political moment. We had the COVID wars. We had the aftermath of George Floyd's murder. And we were a period of acute stress, societal stress, exhaustion, insecurity, and the like. What, what are your reflections as you think back on what happened in that period? You've been, obviously, what we just heard from you is Donald McNeil unfettered by you're retired, you're liberated, you're separated from the New York Times. You're able to have very independent views now, as you've told us. But what are your other reflections now with a little bit more time between that period of separation and today? So it doesn't start in 2021. Really, it starts in 2010 when I became, I mean, I may be unfettered now about my beat, but I kind of became a marked man with Inside the New York Times back in the early 2000s, when I started confronting Arthur Sulzberger at his big State of the Times meetings about things like why did he cancel the employee stock ownership plan and why was he trying to gut the pension plan and why was our health plan not, not as good as it was. And, and, and then when I became a union activist, and I particularly during the 2010 negotiations, I started writing some pretty harsh emails about mostly about the people that the Times had chosen to negotiate on their behalf, which was basically a very bullying Union busting law firm and some people. So, to some extent, the unfettered Donald McNeil always existed, but he was only inside the walls of the New York Times and he was talking about labor issues, you know, wages, working conditions, and benefits. The moment in history in which I said the forbidden word was at a lunch. The word that ultimately led to my departure from the New York Times was at a lunch in a small restaurant in Peru with some teenage girls as part of this uh, Putney student travels trip. 
George Floyd was still alive. The 1619 Project had not been printed. Black Lives Matter has existed as a movement, but was really a sort of a fallout of Ferguson. It had not turned into the explosive issue it had by, by 2021. And I said the word in answer to a question, in asking a question, just trying to find out what somebody else on a videotape had said. And that was at a time when the New York Times used the word fairly frequently, not frequently, but, you know, used the word occasionally in the, and, you know, in, in the course of discussion. I didn't use the word, the euphemism, the N-word, because I've never used that euphemism, because to me, it's baby talk. You know, and, and particularly at the time in 2019, it, you know, when I write about AIDS and I need to discuss penises or vaginas, I don't say in the New York Times, well, and then, of course, it could be transmitted from the B word to the V word or something like that. We use the actual words of the New York Times. I've never been somebody who talked baby talk. Obviously, I didn't get the memo as to how life had changed among teenagers. And so that led to an investigation of me. You know, and like I said, target on my back, you know, this is more than once people have said, you know, it, as the investigation began, they basically threatened me, this is going to end in your firing. After they had completely investigated everything that happened in, in Peru, they finally decided, oh, it's, you know, oh, OK, you didn't defend blackface. You didn't make fun of a shaman. You didn't, you know, say terrible things about black teenagers. You didn't, you weren't a racist running around. You know, you were actually just answering these kids' questions. And they said, you showed bad judgment by using the word in front of that you also showed bad judgment by a joke you made that had to do with teenage girls uh, related to uh, the Zulu Reed dance as an as a anti-age measure, which is too complicated to go into. But anyway, what happened was a letter was put in my file, which is the minimum punishment you can be given at the New York Times. And I was told, you can't go any more any more of these trips again. And by that time, I said, fine, don't I? Zero interest in going on any of these more trips again. You know, I wasn't paid very much. I didn't really want to climb into Machu Picchu again. It had been exhausting the first time. When I did it the second time, I practically passed out. Anyway, so that was it. It was forgotten. And then suddenly I become famous, not attempting to become famous, but that happened because of the and, and the Daily Beast digs up. Somebody obviously leaked the personnel file. So it had to have come from within the New York Times. I have no idea who did it. I don't know. I haven't tried to find out. I don't care. But somebody obviously leaked my personnel file to the Daily Beast, and they wrote an article repeating all the horrible charges against me without repeating what the conclusion was, which is that I hadn't actually done most of these things. And when the article came out, the Daily Beast demands a comment from me, and I'm shocked that the New York Times is taking this seriously and basically said, tell them to piss off. You know, I mean, I'm busy covering a pandemic here. And uh, they said, no, 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 you've got to respond. I said, all right. So I wrote out a long thing that said, this happened. This is how I happen to say the word. This didn't happen. This didn't happen. This didn't happen. This is what really happened in each one of these instances. And the Times forbade me to send that note. I sent it to them and they said, no, you just have to issue an apology for having said the word. And I said, I'm not going to issue an apology that makes it sound like I did everything I'm accused of in this article. I want to say I said the word. I'm sorry I said the word, but I didn't do most of the other things I'm accused of. And this article, The Daily Beast, is false. And they when I refused to do that, sent out their own statement to the Daily Beast and then put out the word inside the Times, Donald refuses to apologize, which, of course, inflamed everybody. I'm sitting at home <laughs> kind of going, I can't believe this is blowing up as big as it is. Why in the world are they paying any attention to something I said over lunch in Peru two years ago? You know, we have bigger fish to fry. I utterly misread the situation. I did not realize it was going to turn into this giant episode, which, you know, four days later led to the editor-in-chief calling me and saying, you've lost the newsroom, whatever that means. I'm not supposed to win the newsroom. He's supposed to, but you lost the newsroom. Therefore, I'd like you to resign. And I went and said, basically, I need a lawyer. And I got a lawyer and I left. Do I think that would happen again nowadays? I don't know. It's hard to know if, I mean, I think that was at the height of a McCarthy-like moment of people being hung out to dry. It had happened to James Bennett. I think there has been so much backlash from what happened to James and what happened to me and what's happened to many other people, sort of, you know, destroyed by Twitter mobs who really did not know the facts, but were you know, willing to believe a badly sourced article in a rag like the Daily Beast that was sourced only to anonymous teenagers. Do I think that would happen again? I'd like to think that calmer heads would prevail, that Joe Kahn, the new editor of the Times, would say, you know what? Let's not put out a press release on day one. Let's not hang Donald out to dry. Let's you know, open up the file. We did investigate this back in 2019. Let's carefully read the file and do what we used to do, which is say, you know what? Thank you for bringing this to our attention. We're not going to have any comment right now. This is an internal personnel matter and none of your business because we like to run our company without you know, hanging people out to dry in public and announcing that you know, they've been publicly flogged and, and, and flung out into the wilderness. That is the way things used to be done under under AG's grandfather, you know, um, Punch Sulzberger, 
you know, who was an ex-Marine, did not try to police the politics of his staff. Did not, and, and there wasn't this habit of beating people in public. That's something that came about after the, the Jason Blair scandal, the Judy Miller scandal, the Rick Bragg scandal, this whole business of we've, we've got to print a 4,000 word story explaining everything that went wrong and then flog the reporter in public and announce exactly what, what you know, how many lashes the flogging is going to involve. That's all new. I hope that's, I hope those days have ended, but we'll see. Thank you. Donald, we end all of these podcasts by just asking our guests, what gives you hope and optimism in this period? Well, there you go. You're sounding like the masthead again. You know, I, I come out all gloomy and gloom and doom, and then you want something. What, no, no, oh, I just want to I want to close on okay, a positive okay. note. I want right. to close on a positive note. What gives me hope on the larger sense of things is it science continues to get better. We we saw, thanks to the mRNA vaccines, how fast you can make a vaccine how fa- and how important it is to pour in enough money to have stocks of that vaccine on hand while you're testing it so that you can roll it out in great numbers. As I, so I'm hoping that the next time we have a pandemic and it will come and I do not know what kind it's going to be, we will have countermeasures real fast. Speed is of the essence in these things. And, and so it's being tough. I mean, some, but the, the non-pharmaceutical measures, including isolation, lockdowns, things like that, are important just to buy time to make a vaccine or a drug. And I hope that'll happen. Thank you. And congratulations on the wisdom of plagues. And thanks for spending so much time with us today, Don. Thank you. I hope I didn't talk too much. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's the point. Uh, well, you know, I, I, you, you wind me up and turn me on. And uh, I can see you kind of, uh, uh, I don't see a moment to break in there, but I know it's tough. Thank you very much for inviting me. This was fun. And thanks for the, those. Are, these are good, very good questions. And I really appreciate you saying them early so I could think about some of them because there are a lot of things I, I, I would have thought. Of. I went back and read one of your pieces about, um, about the uh, military, the number of how few soldiers and Marines had come back into the military after being ousted over the um, the COVID vaccine mandate. And I was thinking back and I was thinking like, man, if the military really gives up on vaccinating soldiers against things that soldiers might get, the possibilities of a bad outcome are so great. I mean, have we forgotten that we lost one of our aircraft carriers and the French lost all of their aircraft carriers as a result of COVID in the early days? You know, only one sailor on the Theodore Roosevelt died, but 600 or something like that people were infected in a very short amount of time. And if you can't, you know, prevent your your own troops from falling, we're back in the old days with Napoleon invading Russia and the Russians killing a certain number of them, but the Russian winter and typhus and dysentery killing most of them. And I, I don't want to see that happen again to our armed forces. I think they're important. Anyway, sorry, another rant. Thank you. All right. Thanks. Take care. Thanks so much. Thank you for listening to The Common Health. If you enjoyed this podcast, please give us a follow and leave a review. To learn more about the CSIS Bipartisan Alliance for Global Health Security or listen to other CSIS podcasts, please visit csis.org.